کنفرانس درباره قتل عام زندانیان سیاسی و نسخ کشی مجاهدین در سال 67 با حضور کارشناسان، گزارشگران و حقوقدانان برجسته بین المللی در پی انتشار گزارش تاریخی جاوید رحمان سوم شهریور 1403 24 اوت 2024 بررسی جنایات سبعانه علیه بشریت در قتل عام زندانیان سیاسی و نسل کشی مجاهدین در سال 67 و اعدام های 1360 و 1361 ضرورت حسابرسی و پایان دادن به مسئولیت آمران و آملان طبق قوانین و معاهدات بین المللی سخنرانی های پروفسور هرتا دایبلرگ ملین وزیر پیشین دادگستری آلمان دکتر مارک الیس مدیر اجرایی انجمن بین المللی وکلا و علی زلفقاری پروفسور هرتا دایبلر گملین وزیر پیشین دادگستری آلمان پروفسور رحمان من شما را تحسین می کنم من زمان زیادی عضو مجمع پارلمانی شورای اروپا بودم و می دانم که صرفا صلاحیت تاریخی و علمی برای تهیه چنین گزارشی کافی نیست بلکه این مستلزم جرأت سیاسی است که شما آن را داشتید این کنفرانس ندای ادالت خواهی برای مردم ایران است و من به طور کامل از آن حمایت می کنم این فریاد برای دموکراسی، حقوق بشر و پایان دادن به مسئولیت کسانی است که در قدرت هستند. Dear President elect Rajavi, dear friends And uh, let's say in this conference hall and at the screens in Albania, as I've been learning, thank you so much for this wonderful welcome. I think as a former politician and law professor and a lawyer, it's most important to show solidarity to your appeal at this conference and to the fight, let's say, your compatriots in and out of Iran are conducting all the time. And I think it's important to show support for the appeals what you have. At this conference, it's the cry for justice for the Iranian people. And I fully support that. It's the cry for democracy, for human rights, and of course, for the end of impunity of the powerful. And I think this is most important We know that quite well. You see, coming from Germany, I can say that we Germans, we had to learn our lessons, historical lessons, the hard way. We learned that a politic that uh, commits order or orders crimes, violations of human rights, the Shoah and other atrocities and crimes against mankind will ruin a country and a population in no time as it did ours. And of course, we have learned uh, that justice, democracy, and let's say human rights don't come for free. And so I really want to repeat my deep respect for all of those who are fighting for this end. And of course, my deeply felt empathy to all, let's say, mothers and fathers and, uh, well, kids and grandchildren of the people who have been killed in the Iran, Iranian regime in the last, let's say, decades. I think to come to the international law. It is most important to have, let's say, a strong international law and functioning mechanisms, well, to uh, put it into practice. You see, as a law student in the 60s at my university in Berlin, I learned of Gustav Monnier. 
He was one of the presidents of the Red Cross at the end of the 19th century. This was the most important time when the first conventions on human rights were agreed upon. They were written down and agreed. And what did he say? He was a really wise man, and I love history as you do, Excellency. He said, well, we can write down conventions, we can agree on conventions, but as long as we do not manage to take those powerful people before an independent international course, they will do what they want. They won't bother with international conventions. And I think he's absolutely right. And we know that, and that's why we need an international independent court. And this was one of the reasons why, as first as a member of the NGO, the Coalition for an International Criminal Court, I, fought, I fight it, I fought for this end. And I could participate in the Rome Conference and I was absolutely lucky as a Minister of, uh, of Justice, well, to ratify the Rome Statute to bring the International Criminal Court to an existence. And of course, to introduce, you have mentioned that, uh, Mrs. Sadat, the first national, international criminal court, which is a, a model and it can help, let's say, to bring those guys to justice if they are, let's say, connecting points with our countries in our areas. So this was very, interesting, I think we have to look for the ICC to be strengthened, to get more teeth, because international law at the moment, well, uh, seems to be rather weaker. Now coming to Professor Hachmann, I admire yourself. You see, having been a long-standing member of the Council of Europe uh, Parliamentary Assembly, I know, that it's not only a question of historical and scientific adeptness to make such a wonderful report, but it takes, of course, political, well, courage, and you had that. Modest as you are, he said, there were some challenges. I can see what you mean. And we are deeply grateful that you wrote this report. You see, another thing is that, of course, in my country and all over Europe, and I hope in all of the Western world, uh, it's quite clear that we have to unite to stop this horror of mass killings now. So I think to summarize it up, it's not only the politics that has to change, and I well agree with all of those who have said that, but it's quite clear that we have to sanction not only the revolutionary guard, this is quite clear, it's more symbolic, we know that, but we have to sanction the judges who are misusing their power by, well, being the henchmen of the Ayatollah regime. And this is most important. And let me say, uh, President-elect, I found your 10-point plan to abolish uh, the death penalty very important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Dr. Mark Ellis. گزارشگر ویژه اهمیت ایجاد مکانیسم حسابرسی بین المللی برای اطمینان از تحقیقات کیفری سری، بیطرفانه و شفاف و ادامه روند آوردن کسانی که اعمال سبعانه را مرتکب شده اند به پای ادالت نشان داده است و این باید معمولیت ما باشد. ما باید دولتها را تشویق کنیم تا از صلاحیت جهانی استفاده کنند و حتی پرونده های منتخب را در یک یا چند کشور اروپایی که اکنون قربانیان در آنجا زندگی می کنند آغاز کنند. در بیشتر حوزه های غذایی، 
دادستان ها اکنون اختیار گسترده ای برای شروع پرونده ها دارند و این برای قربانیان جنایت های سبعانه رژیم ایران یک امید است. Thank you. First, I want to acknowledge that extraordinary time when the families of the victims were up here on the stage. There's nothing that's more important, nothing more emotional than to have seen this group of individuals up here because it reminds us time and time again that what we do, particularly in law, particularly in international law, is to focus on the victims. International criminal law, for me, should always be the voice for the victims. And so let me be clear from my own commitment. You are not forgotten. We will continue to be there for you and for your loved ones until justice is brought to bear. Ms. Rajavi had opened this conference in a, in a reminder for us that we're looking for further steps towards justice for the victims, the previous massacres, and unfortunately, the atrocities that are being committed today. And as I discussed when I was here earlier this year, the adjudication of international crimes is not confined solely to the realm of international tribunals. Jurisdiction over atrocity crimes may be exercised by international and national courts alike. I spoke then, and it has been reported now by the Special Rapporteur's report, that universal jurisdiction is for me potentially the most robust principle of accountability on the national level. Universal jurisdiction has emerged as a significant and increasingly utilized principle within international criminal law, reflecting the global community's commitment to ensuring that the most serious crimes do not go unpunished. The principle allows courts in nations, national courts, to prosecute individuals for grave international crimes, such as war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity. And they can do so regardless of where the crime was committed or the nationality of the perpetrators or the victims. That's the strength of universal jurisdiction. The development of universal jurisdiction has driven and continues to be driven by certain offenses, the most heinous in nature, that represents a threat to the international legal order and to humanity as a whole. Thus, it should be and continues to be subject for prosecution even in the absence of traditional jurisdictional links. Because universal jurisdiction is based solely on the nature of the crime. And again, I might add and must add that this principle is particularly focused on the plight of victims, including the victims in Iran. There are some crimes that now evidenced in the report by the former UN Special Rapporteur. And I might add here, Javed, that most people here have focused on your work on this report. But this gentleman has a stellar and long career on various international issues, and he is respected worldwide. So we owe you, yet again, a great degree of gratitude and thanks, not only for this report, but everything you've done in the past.
the atrocity crimes that has been reported represent, as he said, the most severe and egregious human rights violations in recent history. But I too was happy that the report focused on universal jurisdiction. And let us not forget, as has been mentioned earlier, the principle of universal jurisdiction that was facilitated in the Hameen Nori arrest in Sweden. Now, some have suggested that the Nori case was a failure. I disagree. The trial of Hameen Nori, I think, marked an historic moment as the first legal proceeding related to the 1988 massacres. And I think Kenneth Lewis should be thanked again for the work you did in moving that case forward. We owe you a great deal of gratitude as well. What he did was to involve this extensive witness testimony, including survivors of the massacre, and as you said, bring together a trial, a, a dossier that can be used time and time again. Being found guilty of all charges was extraordinary. Being upheld by the appeals court was even more extraordinary. And I want to say that it serves for me as a precedent in international law and illustrates the very best use of universal jurisdiction in holding individuals accountable for atrocity crimes. It should be a guidepost for us in further bringing victims' claims to states through universal jurisdiction. And yes, there was a conditional form of universal jurisdiction used because Mr. Nori was in Sweden. The court's decision made it quite clear that it saw an absolute form of universal jurisdiction, that it was based solely on his crimes. And as we know and has been mentioned, Nori was released in a prisoner, prisoner exchange deal. I want to make it personally clear that that transaction should never have happened. Individuals found guilty of perpetrating atrocity crimes should serve their sentences in full. Justice demands it, victims deserve it. <laughs> Under the universal jurisdiction principles, Nation states need to create a more robust process to undertake structural investigations where it opens investigations in crimes committed by the Iranian regime, just as was done in Sweden. Suspects are known, the crimes are known, victims at large are known. And it should be a catalyst to further use the principle of universal jurisdiction by victims to bring to justice those that have committed the crimes. And I assure you, many countries, particularly in Europe, already possess this authority to investigate, prosecute, and sentence foreign individuals for core international crimes under universal jurisdiction. Yes, there are constraints, but they are disappearing. In most jurisdictions now, prosecutors are granted wide discretion to initiate cases, and this is the hope for Iran's victims of the atrocities committed. And we have already seen the robust use of universal ju jurisdiction against Syria and its regime, including an incredibly important case here in France of June of this year, where the Court of Appeals had confirmed warrants for by France against Syrian officials including President Assad. And they did so because of the complicity in war crimes and crimes against humanity. And crucially, the appeals court rejected head of state immunity for President Assad, ruling that head of state immunity does not prevail over the commission of crimes 
under international law, such as atrocity crimes. I think this is indicative of the direction and the march that international law is on towards no longer recognizing these types of immunities. So in conclusion, the Special Rapporteur has indicated the importance of establishing an international accountability to ensure prompt, impartial, and transparent criminal investigations and to continue the process of bringing those who committed these atrocities to justice. This should be our mission. This should be the international, committee, uh, international community's commitment to the victims of these atrocities. We should also encourage state, as was stated earlier, to utilize universal jurisdiction and even initiate selected case, cases in one or more European countries where victims now live. Judge Schoenberg has presented another innovative uh, a mechanism that I think he'll mention. But whatever the mechanism is adopted, it must ensure, in the words of the rapporteur, that victims and survivors of the families of those tortured, executed, and forcibly disappeared, that they are given the recognition under international law towards justice. This is what we need to ensure. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, earlier in today's conference, we heard from the families of the victims of the 1988 massacre. And now I would like to give the floor to the survivors of the 1988 massacre who will join me shortly on stage and they will be represented by Ali Zulfaghari, the family. با سلام به شخصیت های عالی قدر حضار گرامی و خواهر مریم عزیز با درود به سر بیست هزار شهید راه آزادی به ویژه قهرمانان نسکوچی خونین سال شست و شست و هفت سخن گفتن از اون مجایدان پاک باز کاری بستشوار است داستان شقاوت های حکومت قتل آم و در مقابلش مقاومت قهرمانان سرموزی که سودای جز آزادی ایران نداشتند این کار هرگز نه در توان من است و نه در ظرفیت این جلسه اما من تنها به عنوان یک شاهد لحظاتی از اون روزها و ماههای هولناک را بازگو می کنم البته در کنار من بازماندگان اون قتل عام ها هستند برادرم نصر الله ملندی یزدان افشارپور که حدودا ده سال زندان بودند برادرم سعید مقصودی از زندان مشهد و همچنین برادران و خواران من در اشرف سه که شاهدان و بازماندگان اون قتل عام هستند من علی زلفقاری اهل رشت از شمال ایران هستم به مدت دوازده سال به تمام هواداری از مجاهدین خلق در زندانهای رشت گوهردشت و ایوین بودم من یکی از بازماندگان قتل عام سال شستاف هستم هیفده ساله بودم که دستگیر شدم و به اعدام محکوم شدم البته بعد به پونزده سال تقلیل پیدا کرد من در زندان گوهردشت در نیمی اول مرداد ما سه بار به راه روی مرگ رفتم در راه روی مرگ زندانیان در انتظار حیات مرگ بودند و بعد به صف می شدند و به سالون مرگ می رفتند و اعدام می شدند 
بار اول نوبت هم نشد چرا که اون روز رو مختص به بچه های کرج کرده بودن و بچه های کرج را ادام می کردن بار دوم که به راه روی مرگ رفتم بچه های بند خودمون رو صدا می کردن علا رقه این که چشمن داشتم ولی صداها رو به خوبی می شنیدم صدای بچه ها اسم اسامی بچه ها رو می گفتن امیر حسین کریمی غلام حسنپور و و و و و بچه ها به صف می شدن اون روز نمی دونستم بچه ها رو کجا می برن ولی بعدا فهمیدم که اونها رو به سالون مرگ یا همون حسینی گوهردش می بردن به اعدام کردن فرزین نصرتی یکی از این زندانیان بود دانشوی سال آخر پزشکی قهرمان کشتی دانشگاه به قادر حوادر از مجاهدین پونزه سال حکم بهش دادن ولی اما اون روزها اعدام شد وقتی من جلوی حیات مرگ رفتم چند آخوند و شخصی اینجا نشسته بودن اول اونا رو نشناختم اما بعدا فهمیدم رئیسشون حسین علی نگری ابراهیم رئیسی رئیس جمهور سقط شده رژیم و اسماعیل شوشتری و پور محمدی بودن سومین باری که به راه روی مرگ رفتم وای که چه قوقایی بود از زیر چشمن می دیدم از راه پله ها که می رفتم راه پله ها راه روها فری همه پر بودن همه پر از زندانی به نظر من اون روز تقریبا همه بچه ها می دونستن که دارن اعدام می کنن. همه منتظر حیات مرگ بودن هادی محمد نجاد رو دیدم تو بند تو بند قبلی مسئول من بود اخبار زندان رو با هم رد بدل کردیم و اخبار اعدامو هادی سه تا از برادرش قبلا اعدام شده بودن هادی چهارمین نفری بود از یک خانواده اعدام شد البته ما از این خانواده ها خیلی زیاد داریم که چندین تن از اعضای خانواده به جرم هواداری از مجاهدین اعدام شدن یادم میاد عواسط مرداد بود وقتی که تو راروی مرد نشسته بودم منتظر دادگاه بودم دادگاه دومه متوجه شدم کنارم بیروز شای مقنی نشسته قبلا بیروز رو تو بند با هم بودیم به بیروز گفتم بیروز داره نیدام میکنن موازه باش به روز یک خندی کرد و گفت من از دادگاه آمدم و از مجاهدین حمایت کردم بذار هر چی میخواد بشه به روز همون لحظه سرود ایران زمین رو برام خوند یک لحظه آمد از ملک ایران زمین غرش خلق ایران به گوش بر تن و جان احریمنان لرزه افتاده از این خروش همین لحظه حمید نوری جلاد سر رسید و یه لقد محکمی پشت به روز زد و پوش ناسزا گفت و گفت منافق بی شرف انا میبرم تو رو راحت میکنم و به روز رو بلند کرد از بغل من و برد و من دیگه به روز رو ندیدم از زندان رشت بگویم من با بسیاری از خانواده های زندانیان بعد از آزادی رابطه داشتم 
خانواده های حسن نظام پسند ابراهیم سالمی علی نیخا رحمان چراغی و خیلی از خانواده های دیگر از زندان رشت همه بچهای مجاهد رو اعدام کرده بودند ولی هیچ خبری ازشون نداریم چون کسی زنده نمانده بود این داستان تلخ همه زندان های کشوره در زندان اصفهان که یکی از نزدیکانم در زمان قتل عام اونجا بود به من گفت که از بند خودشون بیش از هفتاد نفر از مجاهدین رو اعدام کردن فریادهای سرخ اون سی هزار زندانی سیاسی سر موزه و دیگری شهیدان با وجود همه ترفندها رژیم و همدستانش دیوارهای سنگی زندانهای رژیم رو شکست و امروز در شعارهای مرگ بر دیکتاتور و زنده باد آزادی زنان و جوانان و شروزی تنین اندازه و این نبردیست تا پیروزی قسم به خون یاران استاده ایم تا پایان استاده ایم تا پایان قسم به خون یاران استاده ایم تا پایان قسم به خون یاران استاده ایم تا پایان قسم به خون یاران استاده ایم تا پایان ممنون مرسی